Welcome back, everybody. Hope you're all refreshed. I know certainly all that talk about food factories made me a bit snacky. So, yeah, had a little snack myself. So hopefully you're all refreshed as I am. Um, fantastic. Great. Um, moving into the second part of our forum today. Yeah, we've got our, our sponsors, Lodi, coming up next. Um, without Lodi, you know, we wouldn't be able to, it would be a lot harder to run these events, you know, really support us in that. So we really appreciate Lodi, some promotions they're doing, um, some competitions you can enter, which I'm sure Matt will possibly mention in a moment. But without further ado, Matt's going to be talking about a complete approach to wasp and hornet control. Again, like I mentioned at the beginning, very seasonal, and I'm sure all of you have got lots of questions. We can get in at the end of the presentation, but without further ado, Matt, um, if you would like to, morning. Um, there we go. We can see you. fabulous, great. I don't, know, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, as I always. <laughs> great, um, fantastic. Well, listen, I'll leave you leave you to it. If you want to share your screen, and yeah, we'll uh, we'll we'll do some Austin Hornet stuff. Brilliant. Thank you, Natalie. Uh, right, good morning, everybody. Uh, bear with me a second. Let's get this up and move this out of the way. Hope everybody's doing well today. Uh, thanks to the BPCA for allowing us to sponsor the event. Um, it's always great to uh, to support the industry like this and uh, to support you guys as well. And as Natalie said, we have got a lot of competitions and things coming up, and I'll talk to you about one specifically towards the end of the presentation. So I want to have a bit of a chat with you about um, Wasp and Warnick Control um, and uh, some of the products that we provide as a business uh, for you guys out there to use in your arsenal. And I think the best place to start, obviously, is with the insects themselves. I've tried to make it slightly different. I've done a bit of research into some different and unusual facts about these insects. So I think uh, hopefully there might be a couple of things in here that, uh, that you guys uh, sort of didn't know. Um, I'm sure there'll be a lot that you do. So uh, let's crack on. Okay, so I've got to start with a few wasp facts. Wasps and hornets first developed around about 250 million years ago in the mid-Triassic. Um, they branched off from a form of lacewing around about 400 million years ago, which was in the mid-Carboniferous period. And they developed from there into several different species and branched out into the tens of thousands of different species that we have in the present day. So found all over the world, except Antarctica, uh, for obvious reasons. Um, don't like the snow, as a lot of people don't. Uh, but um, so they are found all over the world and wherever there are people, there are wasps. And a lot of them are pretty sort of safe and they're not going to cause you any major amount of issues. Unfortunately, though, guys, 80% of fatalities, uh, a bit of a morbid fact, uh, from stings are men. Uh, and it's believed that this is down to uh, guys being in more close proximity to wasps in terms of the types of work that they carry out. Not sure why that is, but uh, but yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's a little bit of a found out. The largest wasp ever discovered in China is a wasp that they've happily nicknamed the Godzilla wasp or the Godzilla hornet. And it's called this because of the way that it plunges into the water to attack its prey, which is a small waterborne caterpillar. And then it bursts out of water very similar to the way Godzilla does in the movies. And that's hence given its, its nickname. And obviously, you can see from the size there, 2.3 inches in length and a wingspan of just under four inches. It's pretty pretty formidable. If you ever look at the picture of it, uh, it's thing is, is not something that you want to tackle. Uh, it's a little bit of something I wanted to include myself here. Uh, this is a video that I took, and I think once you're a pest controller, as I have been previously, you're always a pest controller. You're always going to look out for things like this and find these sorts of things more interesting than maybe most people do. But this was on a uh, on a trip to Australia several years ago. On the way down to the beach, and came across this little battle going on. Uh, this is a wetter. Uh, didn't actually see whether the wasp killed the wetter, but uh, certainly uh, trying to drag it off somewhere, either to lay its eggs on it or to, uh, to to feast on it at some point. But I uh, just thought it was a nice little video to include in there, it's something a little bit fun as well. So coming on to the wasps themselves, uh, they're divided into two primary subgroups. So we have social and we have solitary. Um, now, the ones that you guys will deal with pretty much on a daily basis are you social, um, and they make up around about 1% of the total wasp species around the world. So not a very huge amount of, uh, of wasps uh, you know, in terms of the social uh, that are going to cause you any issues. So not many of them sting, not many of them cause the issues that we have with regards to you know, the German wasp or the common wasp, um, and most of them are quite harmless as well. So these, these wasps will start a colony every spring, which is started from an impregnated queen um, who has survived the winter by hibernating in a nice, warm, warm dry space, maybe a roof space or a log pile. And, uh, and then she will then emerge and then sort of complete uh, or start the cycle all over again. And then you've got the solitary wasps, which are by far the biggest subgroup. Um, we've got a wood wasp there. 
sure lots of you will have seen these. Um, these have what look like a very formidable sting on the back, but it's actually an ovipositor for eggs. So it's not a sting, it's not something that's big enough to pierce your straight in the blooming heart, but uh, they, uh, they do look pretty, uh, pretty scary. So here we've got the different types of species that you primarily deal with in the UK. You've got the common wasp or Vespula vulgaris, um, and we have the German wasp, which is Vespula germanica. There are a few of the different species, the Norwegian wasp, tree wasps. These are probably the, the ones you're going to come across the most. The best way to differentiate between the two is there's, there's slight differences in the stripes, but if you want to get up close and personal, you've got pictures down the right. You've got an anchor shape on the common wasp across the face, and then you have three dots on the German wasp. Um, so it's, they don't tend to have one dot. They normally have around about three across the face. So it's a good way to, to differentiate between the two if you really want to get down to it into that sort of detail. We've got the European Hornet, Vespa Carabo. I think it's pretty straightforward. You all know this. Uh, it's the size. Um, these insects are huge. Um, they do have a slight coloration on them. Uh, they have a very reddish brown hue to the back across the thorax and the abdomen. Uh, but in general, it does tend to be that it's the size of the insect that, that immediately uh, indicates that you're dealing with hornets. And these are all from social uh, groups. Um, so this is really straightforward, guys. I, put a, I wanted to just do a little bit of comparison between bees and wasps. We might have a few uh, sort of new starters to the industry on here. I know a lot of you, when you get calls at this time of year, that you'll know immediately if the customer sends you a video what you're dealing with. But it'll come on to the next thing that I want to talk about. So I just sort of put, put a few differences down. So they're similar in size, but obviously there's, there's a distinct difference in terms of the colour. Wasps are very dark black and yellow with those distinctive, distinctive stripes, whereas bees are very nondescript. They have a light brown and golden colour, um, so that they are different in terms of the way that they look. Bees are covered with downy hairs, and this assists with their pollen collecting. So they've got hairs on the thorax, abdomen, all over the legs. And this helps them when they come into contact with the flower to pick up the pollen and to take it back to the hive. Wasps are more streamlined in appearance and shape. Um, you'll have all seen this. Uh, they're very, very sort of slender and slim, and they have that definite break in the abdomen. Bees do have that break, but obviously you've got uh, those hairs and the wings and all that sort of stuff sort of hiding that from you. And wasps legs hang down during flight, whereas bees they sort of tend to um, they tend to sort of pull them back up into the body. And the, one of the biggest things is with a bee, unfortunately, bees aren't going to want to sting you as we know this. Um, if a bee stings you, the chances are it's going to die because it will pull that sting back out of the abdomen and sort of kill the bee. Whereas a wasp, unfortunately, doesn't have a barb and uh, the little buggers will uh, sting you quite repeatedly over and over again. So this is the reason I wanted to mention this, guys. Um, we know that there are no legislation surrounding the control of bees. However, as a company, we need to stress that none of our products are licensed for the use against bees. So please remember that when you're out in the field, there isn't anything you can use that lowly supply that has bees on the label. They're not, we know they're not protected. We know that obviously there are situations and circumstances, health and safety being the biggest one, that you may have to treat these insects, and we appreciate that. But unfortunately, we just don't have any products that will help you uh, to, to assist you in that. So we just wanted to get that point across and just let you guys know there are products out there, but unfortunately it's not something that we that we actually do. So why do we control wasps? Um, biggest reason, health and safety. I think it's probably the biggest, if, if not the only reason that people will call you out for wasps. They're fearful of them, they can cause problems obviously with stings and things, but the health and safety aspect is the biggest. First reported beast uh, wasp sting, which again, I thought was quite, you know, quite a fun fact was in 2621 BC, and this was an Egyptian king who shortly succumbed, unfortunately, to this thing afterwards from anaphylaxis that we know today. In the UK, from the, um, the, the amount of stings that we're presented with every year, thankfully only 12% of those stings present any serious issues, and those are things like localised swelling, uh, fluid buildup, uh, potentially breathing difficulties, and in very severe cases, unfortunately, can cause death. So around about four to six people, unfortunately, will die from anaphylaxia in the UK. Now, what guys, all I would say to you is, is just keep your antihistamines on you. Not necessarily, you know, fingers crossed, you know, no one's going to have a severe reaction, but even a mild reaction, antihistamines can help you and they can help reduce all of those uh, potential issues you might get from suffering from a bee or a moth thing. Anaphylaxia, don't forget, can appear at any time. It's not something you're born with. It's something that potentially you could get stung a thousand times, suffer that 1,001 sting, and then suddenly succumb to an anaphylactic shock. 
just be careful. You guys are in the front line and you're, you're, you're facing this every single day. So just make sure you take the necessary safety precautions. I put damage on here. Um, it's not something I've come across and that's why I put a question mark. Um, I know a couple of customers have said that people have reported that the nest can potentially cause slight damage. I think mainly it's down to the wasp stripping the wood and garden sheds, things like that for nest building. Um, and in large populations, you know, it can cause slight damage to all the garden furniture. But I put that on there is it was just something I didn't want to ignore. And then secondary pest issues as well. So uh, things like common clothes, not textile pests, all can be sort of, um, yeah, that can develop from an issue with a wasp nest that, that's, that's been left or abandoned. Um, and then potentially you can get an issue sort of filtering down into a property from secondary pest species. Okay, so a little bit about the colony structure and the hierarchy. So as we said earlier, we have the queen, she emerges in the spring. Um, she's a little bit late, I think, in a lot of cases this year, although I know, I've noticed a lot of you are now starting to get those call outs, which is great. Um, she emerges in the spring, having overwintered somewhere nearby, already impregnated. Um, nice wood pile or a roof space, and then she starts to build her nest. And that's that sort of half gold full shape, shape that you can normally see her sort of curling around in. And she'll build the cells inside that nest in order to start laying those first eggs. When she starts laying those eggs, after around about 30 days, those, uh, those wasps will then start to hatch, and that's when the colony starts to build. Um, and after a short period of time, those workers will then take over all the duties. And that queen then literally becomes an egg-laying machine. Um, I don't know whether you've seen the film Aliens, um, I'm a big fan, uh, but James Cameron based that film around parasitic wasps. So the, the, the queen aliens sort of nesting in that area, sending the troops out to bring back food to protect the eggs and to build the nest. Um, obviously, thankfully, wasps don't lay an egg in your chest to burst out. Uh, but yeah, so once she gets to a certain point, she will then start to lay a sexual brood. So she'll start to then lay male and female eggs. Um, but the offspring in order to be able to uh, to continue the, uh, the the process over the course of the next year. And then once the females leave, they then mate, and then the whole process is repeated, and they will then spend the winter in a nice, warm, safe place in order to start the cycle off again the next year. So coming on to the treatment process. You'll hear me talk about this in presentations, guys, um, and I'm a big believer in it. I always think you should always carry out a site-specific risk assessment. I understand you're not necessarily going to carry one out when you do a survey for a wasp nest. You probably don't even need to go and do a survey, but always carry out a site-specific risk assessment when you're doing your treatments. Make sure there are no open water sources. If you're using dust and injecting into a building, the last thing you want is a gust of wind comes and carries that into the next door neighbours or that garden pond. So always make sure that you're doing your site-specific risk assessments. Make sure there's no open water tanks in lost spaces. If you're treating it in somewhere very odd, like a, uh, like a boiler cupboard, don't be using aerosols, don't be using products that potentially could cause you issues in that area. Um, working at heights, do you need access equipment? You know, sell the job correctly. Don't try and stand on a ladder with one hand on there, one foot on there, leaning over with your lamps, and then you fall off or you get stung and fall off. So just make sure that you, you, you're following all these sorts of guidelines. Correct PPE. We don't unfortunately sell PPE, but you know, make sure you've got a good bee suit, you've got your gauntlets, you've got your bee veil, um, and then make sure that it's tightly zipped up because I've seen where wasps will get into the bee suit and the last thing you want is one of those in there with you. And bats or birds. Um, a lot of people are scared uh, to, to talk to the, to the bats trust. And personally, my experience in the past has been, you know, I've won jobs in the past from people who've walked away and said, absolutely not, you've got bats. Contact the Bats Trust, they're great. You know, they're, they're, I've worked with them in a lot of occasions where they come out to a site and they've actually said, well, you can't do that, but you can do this. Um, and it will help you to sell the job a lot better if you need to. So one of our products that we have available to you guys is Insect Freeze. I can see you sitting there now shaking your head saying, well, you try and get to a nest of 40,000 wasps with a can of insect free spray. I get that. But what, what maybe you could use this for is, is when you get those smaller nests at the beginning of the year, if you get a nest on a shed or on the side of the house, if you can get to it with something like this, this will work exceptionally well for you. It's fast acting, it's non-toxic. It can be used in much more areas than the chemical product. You can go and use it out in the field if you've got a nest in a tree. It's obviously safe to do so. You could use something like this particular product. It's odorless and non-staining. You're not going to get Mrs. Smith complaining that you've put a patch on a wall from, from a, a chemical using an oil base. And uh, it doesn't use poison. It just basically freezes the insect by dropping the temperature down to minus 40 degrees. I've actually used this product on ants, and it, uh, apart from blasting them into space, it works exceptionally well. Uh, I didn't get any of them come back. 
Um, and it works by bursting the insect cells. So it freezes the insect cells to the point that they burst and death is pretty immediate. And as I said before, it can be used in areas where chemicals can't. So it's a really good one to carry around in your arsenal. So uh, probably one of the biggest ones that we sell, and we sell tens of thousands of cans of this every year, is uh, our wasp and hornet nest destroyer. Uh, it's an aerosol with a permethrin and tetramethrin knockdown. So you've got a really good, strong tetramethrin um, to, to bring that problem down to a, uh, a manageable level really quickly. And the great thing about this product is you can stand around 15 to 18 feet away and you can spray. Obviously, you need a sort of direct line for the nest, but you can spray giving you total control and safety as well. So you don't have to get up close and personal with those particular issues. We estimate around 80% of pest controllers currently use this as a go-to product. Um, we, we, I'll come on to some of the products shortly, but we, you know, we, we pretty much think that a lot of you, if not all of you, have got this in your van or have had this in your van at some point. And it's, it's probably one of the most used go-to products um, that, that are available to you out there at the moment. And it can be used in conjunction with an application equipment. It can be used in conjunction with the Aerosol 3 that's uh, available from Lance Labs. Um, so you can use this product with application. That will give you an even more direct control over what you're treating. So it's a good one to use if you've got anything like the Aerosol 3. This is, uh, you guys, you're always going to hear me talk about this. It's never going to change. Um, it's in every single presentation that I do, and, I, I, and I've, you know, I'm never going to apologise for it because it's an absolute fantastic product, and you're all starting to come around to it now. Obviously, guys, I have to stress, you know, make sure you're using it in the correct locations. Make sure you're using it with the correct application. It is HSE approved. It is. It has been licensed. To, you know, it's it's fully available to, for you guys to use. But obviously, just make sure you're using it for the right jobs. It's oil based. And it's the strongest oil-based ready-to-use available to you guys on the market at the moment. And it contains the permethrin and tetramethrin fix as well. It's a long-term residual, not that it's needed for a wasp nest, but you get around about three months on the residual out of that. Breaks down the nest as well, being oil-based, it'll start to break down the nest. So if you can inject it directly into the nest, you're going to get control over it a lot quicker as well. And it can either be sprayed or fogged. Um, but what I will say to you guys, it is an oil base. It is potentially going to be a little bit corrosive. Make sure you carry out the regular maintenance of your sprayers. And if you do that, you, you're going to have a really good long life with your sprayer and you'll have a really good long life being able to use this particular product. Always carry out a patch test. Don't just take it to chance. Make sure you do your patch test. Brickwork, woodwork is going to be a porous surface. So potentially being oil base, it might stain. Always just do your patch test, and once you've covered all those angles, it's a safe product to use, and you, you'll learn. You'll, you'll really enjoy using it as well. Uh, so, last product on the list, not one of our products. I think we'd be very naive as a company to not mention it uh, because I think pretty much everybody uses it, and I think so. I think you know we, we need to give Firecam D a mention. It's a product that we do sell on behalf of Bayer, um, and it's a ready-to-use dusting powder. So you've got your Bendio carbon there. A control of wasp and hornet, um, and it also does have Asian hornets on the on the label as well. Um, I think pretty much you're all going to use this. It says it's an indoor nest treatment. If I am wrong about this, please someone raise this to me. But my understanding of an indoor nest treatment is as long as you have an access point into that nest and you can inject it safely through that access point, that is classed as an indoor treatment. If I am wrong, please somebody correct me. But uh, that's my that's my overall understanding of the of the product itself. And it can only be used when you're using it with a manual or a powered application as well. Obviously, DR5, your AR8, anything like that, uh, you can use this product through. And the good thing about it is, unlike some of the products out there, it will not excite the wasps. So it is going to keep them nice and calm and uh, allow you to get control over the problem quite quickly. But finally, guys, uh, our summer promotion and competition. So we are running a summer promotion, which will run until around about September. Um, and what we're asking for you guys to do is a video. It's a minute and a half video. Um, there are a few terms and conditions, uh, which we will post on Facebook and on our website. Uh, but we're going to give everybody who enters, um, who enters with a valid video, who's followed all the rules, uh, a chance that, that, that you'll all get a load of some loaded beers, which is the best part. And then we'll pick five winners. There'll be an overall winner, which you'll win a uh, trial camera with a case. You'll win a, a sprayer. You'll win some insecticide. And then the others, you're going to win some insecticide and some beers and some other bits as well. So the best video will win the bundle. Um, so if you need any more information on that, please give me a shout. But it will be on my Facebook page as well. Cool. Any questions, guys and girls?
Thanks, Matt. That was fantastic. Thank you. You got through that very smoothly and efficiently. <laughs> um, got a few questions that are coming as well, so I'll, I'll pop them out. I mean, just regards to the FICAM D bit, yeah, you're absolutely right with, with what you say. And I remember speaking to the, the manufacturers about it, and they, they say that, yeah, if you as long as it, it goes into that cavity and it goes yeah. inside, it's fine. But I think historically how we used to use it, or I remember using it, is that the instructions were, you know, you leave a bit of residue outside on the tiles, then those wasp land and take it in for you. Whereas that's an absolute no-no. Obviously, if there's any risk yeah. of any of that product being external in any way shape or form it shouldn't be used and and, and something else so yeah as long as it is genuinely inside that cavity we're, we're okay yeah, I, thought, I thought it was that just, i thought you know if i was wrong the best to point it out and let me know so i can no, make that it. that was perfect yeah no that was that was great um fab right we've got yeah we've got we'll, we'll get all the questions done i know um ian who's on at the end said that he doesn't mind if uh if your guys you guys, guys run over a little bit because you're the most important ones um so <laughs> you know all of you, I don't just mean loaded, you know, all of our presenters, but yeah, if we need to go over a bit, we will. So let's get these questions. We've got six of them in there. Okay. So, um, hi Matt, will free spray work for wasps nesting the ground? Yeah, depending on how far it is, that is down into the ground. Um, I mean, normally they're quite shallow anyway, so I, it should it should still work. So if you, you've you got that straw on the end, so if you can get that down into the ground and into the nest, and yes, there's no reason why you can't use it. There are other organ X products that you can use that are more of a polymer-based product, um, a liquid base, and you can use those pretty much anywhere as well. But mm. I think the free spray gives you that more direct sort of um, you know, access into the nest itself, especially if you can penetrate the nest. So you've got to get that direct contact on the actual insect, yeah. haven't you, I think? Yeah. Yeah, good stuff. I mean, it's a great thing. You brought it up as one of your first um, recommendations, and that's great in terms of like cosh hierarchy as well in using something that's non-toxic, you know, and customers are always going to love that. You can say, look, I'm not yeah, using insecticides. Exactly. It's it's quick. It's non-toxic. They're always going to like it. So yeah. great, great product there if it's if it's uh, useful to the situation. Um, okay, can the general public buy your products? The general public, um, if you're talking about organics and things like that, then obviously they're non-toxic, so they can be bought through other channels. Um, with regards to professional products, we always say to people, you know, yes, okay, technically there are no laws out there with regards to the use of, of chemical insecticides. However, as a company, please let me know if there's anything that people are using that you see out there that shouldn't be. Give me a shout and let me know that they are professional and they're for, for professional use for you guys only. Great. Good stuff. It's coming here from Mike because uh, you mentioned FICAM D there. He's just wondering, he thought that the use of FICAM dust had been discontinued. FICAM dust, no. FICAM W has been discontinued, but FICAM D is still, as far as I'm aware, going good and strong. So yeah, you can still, you can still buy your FICAM D. Yeah, there's a major late. Sorry if anyone can hear barking in the background. <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> just always, the it's always at the wrong time, isn't it? I've got doors closed, but no, they're so loud. He's very butch. Um, but yeah, so with the FICAM, it's the big label change, wasn't it? it took bees off of the label officially. So um, I think that was maybe what, what Mike's um, remembering there. So yeah, like yeah. you said, FICAM D still around and with us. Um, Fab, so does uh, Lodi sell their products outside the UK? Oh, that's a good question. We do have, we have ranges of products, obviously, through the Loaded Group that people can buy from outside the UK. That would be, you'd need to contact the uh, the, the main office in France. Um, but as far as I'm aware, yes, there are certain products that we do that we manufacture for other places around the world. So if they are products you can use in other areas. Great. Good stuff. Um, another question about the freeze spray, popular one, which is always good. Um, what about wasps outside the nest that return at a later time? Yeah, there is always that issue. Um, obviously, there's no residual with these with organic products, and that's what makes them organic. They're not, you know, they're not something that's going to potentially cause any uh, any issues once they've been put down and sprayed. Um, so there is always that problem if you've got wasps out foraging um, and you're treating an nest. This is why I say with the insect free spray, you don't want to go and do a thirty, forty thousand plus nest. You know, you need to be the beginning of the season when the nests are small. I know a lot of you had call outs to customers and you get there and they'd literally be sort of this size or this size. These sorts of sprays are great just to take out the bag and just give it a good spray. And you know pretty much you're gonna you're gonna get the problem under control and take the take the nest away with you there and then as well. Mm. So I'm guessing with those free sprays, and let's say they've got a you know tennis ball size nest that you know is quite yeah. accessible. 
Are they gonna? I suppose are they gonna need to sort of split that nest open a bit to treat it with a freeze spray to actually yeah, get the insects? I mean, if you, if, yeah, if you can if you can break the nest open or if you can get the straw into the nest, I mean it will sort of permeate outwards once you start to release it. You've got the straw in there; it's going to start to sort of push outwards back out towards the, the edge of the nest. As long as you can get that straw in there, it will, it will still do the same job. We did. I did want to put a video in the presentation. We had a pest controller using the free spray, but for some reason we can't seem to locate the little thing. So uh, we're going to find that and put that on our website and it will show you guys how to use it. And I mean, the, the, the competition we're running as well, guys, if you can, um, you know, if you can get us a video of you using it, so basically the video has got to be a minute and a half, you using our products. Um, you know, you, you, there's a few rules, you've got to be reading the label, you need to talk about what you're treating. Um, and we can use those videos and then we will sort of judge them on that basis. So if there's anything that you can do, if someone wants to use the free spray and do a video on that uh, on that score, then you know, buy a bowl and send it over, no worries at all. Great, good stuff. Um, uh, okay, for anonymous question here. So what are the benefits of an aerosol over a dust as I've got a lot clo- uh, as I have to get a lot closer? Oh, okay, so getting a lot closer to the nest, what's yeah. the benefits of aerosol and dust? Well, I mean, the, the good thing about the, the wasp and hornet nest is you don't actually need to get that close. If you can see the nest and the nest is within your eyesight, you know, you can stand around about 15 feet away from that nest and you can still treat it safely without getting up close and personal. That's the good thing about using that particular aerosol. Yes, the free spray, you need to be you know, a couple of feet, which is why I say don't do it for any, you know, make sure you're doing your risk assessment first as to whether it's safe to use it. But if you, if you wasp for a warning nest, you can stand at a distance and, and you can spray treat and that, will, I don't know if you've not used it, then give it a go because you can blast it out and it will work you know, exceptionally well from a distance. Mm-hmm. And it's quick acting, isn't it? It's kind of it is, you know, yeah, instantly. Very quick, yeah. Yeah, which is good for us, isn't it? So they're not going to attack us maybe as much. We all know <laughs> upsetting them when they start coming for us. Exactly. And the, the good thing about things like wasp and hornet's perbio chalk is you've got that, you know, if, you, if you're a sort of um, you know, pest controller, you go away and you have to come back to pick up the nest. You know, with these sorts of products, there's a potential that, you know, you can send the paperwork to the customer and then by the time the nest has calmed down and, and has died off, especially with perbio chalk, you can go and actually take that nest away with you, you know, cut it down, put it in a bag, take it away and dispose of it accordingly. So mm-hmm. there's, there's things like that with regards to quick fast acting products as well. Great, good stuff. Um, there's no other questions in there. There's a comment, comment from Emily regarding, uh, you know, the frustrations we all have when we're talking about bees, you know, honeybees. Obviously, I know this presentation is more wasps and, and hornets, but obviously bees are something that we're getting a lot of calls for. And yes. um, she's mentioned there that, you know, there, there is a, a group, uh, UK bee removers that, you know, can can advise and help with that. There's lots of other companies out there that are doing bee removal a lot more now. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, I think it's important that maybe you, you make the right contacts because beekeepers generally won't deal with things like, right. you know, bees and cavities, will they? This is it. And I, I mean, if anybody needs any help with those sorts of things, you know, we, what I like to try and do with my customer base is connect you all. You know, we're all in the same industry. We should all support each other. Um, and, and what I like to do is if a customer rings me up and says, you know, I'm in this area. Do you know anybody that can help me with a bees nest? I might have been talking to somebody else that knows somebody. So there's, there's that connection there mm-hmm. where I can put you in touch with somebody that can give you a hand to come out and take the, remove the bees nest for you. So always we'll just give me a shout. Just, just put, the, put the question to me. It's not a problem at all. That's it. It's who you know, not what you know sometimes as well, isn't it? So that, that's great. Yeah, great useful information. Fabulous. Well, yeah, that's all the questions done. Um, cool. Great, Matt. That was that was, that was was great. And uh, yeah, thank you for your time and thank you for sponsoring us as well. And we'll yeah, catch you later. Take care. Have all right. Day. Take yeah. care. Thanks, Matt. Bye.